We thank you again for joining us for College Day scheduled from October 19th to the 23rd. This is a recorded session. Um, you will find it under the Friday workshops. Um, and we encourage you to please share this recording with friends, family, colleagues all over Santa Clara County, across the Nine Bay Area counties, and everywhere in California. My name is Meredith Curry. You can call me Mayor. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a fellow of the Northern California College Promise Coalition, hailing from East San Jose. The Northern California College Promise Coalition is a regional effort to bring together leaders, practitioners, and resources, and share leadership over the shape of college success efforts in the region. Our community is focused on changing outcomes and systems for low-income, underrepresented youth in four key areas, aligning public policy, enabling the transition into the workforce, creating campus partnerships, and speeding up the adherence to best practices. We believe that together we can change the trajectory for thousands of Northern California students, and we're excited that many of our coalition members are a part of this scholarship panel. So what are we gonna to cover today in our workshop, hashtag Free Money Fridays with your local scholarships? First, we're gonna talk about what are scholarships and why are we spending this time talking about it? Then we'll give you some clarity as to what is this hashtag Free Money Fridays and how do we want you to use it during and after the session? Then I'm gonna introduce you to our fabulous panelists and I'll answer, um, I apologize, I'll ask them some questions um, and each panelist will get to share their perspective, both as someone who's gone through the process of accessing scholarships and going through the college access and success process themselves as individuals and as staff of organizations that provide these scholarships to you. Lastly, we'll end with a Q&A with questions asked by students. So what is a scholarship? At the end of the day, scholarship is free money. It's gift aid. It's money that you shouldn't have to pay back, though you may have to meet some specific requirements to get it, and you may have to meet some uh, specific requirements to keep it. And I'm going to let our panel tell you more about that. But an important thing we want you to think about, if someone offered you a few hundred or a few thousand dollars for a few hours of effort, you'd probably take it. So don't let yourself lose motivation apply to as many scholarships as you can, and you'll get to meet several of those scholarships today, as well as an organization that collects scholarships and helps students to take advantage of those resources. A few key um, tips we want you to have now as you think about the different scholarships you want to apply to and learn about them today. First, know that scholarships are available to high school and college students, and some are available as early as middle school, some are available into graduate school. The important thing to note here is to always look out for scholarships. Ask around and see what scholarships others are applying to and make sure you explore the scholarships you learn about from today's panel. If it's not a scholarship you qualify for, please share it around, someone else might. Most scholarships will require an application. At this point, they're more, more, most likely to be online applications. So you wanna make sure that you track the application deadlines and get your documents in on time. And just like college applications and financial aid applications like the FAFSA or California DREAM Act, you do not want to wait until the last minute. So when you know the deadline, aim to apply early. Most scholarship applications require an essay or some type of work product like a portfolio. So make sure that you, when you review the application deadline, you check and see what is in the application. It might not just take you days, it may take you a couple weeks to get your things together. So make sure you plan ahead. You wanna make sure you have letters of recommendation and contact information for those key trusted individuals in your life who can help to advocate on your behalf to scholarship organizations. And we, that can be somebody at your school, that can be somebody from an extracurricular activity you're a part of, like if you play a sport or in choir um, or in volunteer activities. If you're part of one of these amazing um, organizations that we're gonna be um, sharing today, it could be any one of them as well. So please make sure that you start to look at um, and identify who are those individuals, those adults in your life who can advocate for you with your scholarship applications and get their current contact information immediately. Also, keep track of application deadlines. You might hear some of those deadlines today, write them down. 
Um, and lastly, stay motivated. There are a lot of scholarships. We want you to apply to as many that you qualify for as you can. And we want you to make sure that you're always looking at scholarships because some have rolling deadlines. Some are available in the fall, some are available in the spring, some in the summer. Again, today you're gonna to get to meet several scholarships and learn more about the, them. And we want you to take advantage of any resources they share with you today. So what's the hashtag Free Money Fridays? That is a um, hashtag from the coalition, and we want you to use it to help share how excited we all are about scholarships, right? So did you apply to scholarship? Please share it, hashtag Free Money Fridays. Did you get that scholarship? Share it, hashtag Free Money Fridays. And did you renew it? Because sometimes you can renew for scholarships and every year you get it, you wanna share that as a su success. So hashtag Free Money Friday. All right. I am so excited to introduce the first of our set of panelists. Today, we have Noemi Garibay, College Success Fellow for 10,000 Degrees. The 10,000 Degrees Community College Success Scholarship is a need-based scholarship for high school seniors from low-income backgrounds who will be pursuing the community college pathway. In addition to ongoing scholarship support, students will receive in-person virtual college advising support to and through transfer and attainment of their baccalaureate degree from their four-year university. And for those who aren't familiar with the term bac baccalaureate degree, you may know that more as BA or BS. I'm also so pleased to introduce Rocio Preciado, High School Engagement Manager for Immigrants Rising. Immigrants Rising empowers undocumented young people to achieve educational and career goals through personal, institutional, and policy transformation. They have made the scholarship search specifically easier for all undocumented students. They offer a scholarship list organized by month, and these scholarships are open to students who are undocumented, so you'll learn more about that list today. We're also so pleased to welcome Leanne Brianna Aratea, Program Coordinator for the Peninsula College Fund. The mission of the Peninsula College Fund is to empower low-income, first-generation college students to graduate and obtain a job that aligns with their career goals. They provide four-year scholarships, one-to-one -one adult mentors, college and career success training, and internship support. The Peninsula College Fund provides all scholars with mentoring, college and career success training, summer internship support, and a $12,000 college scholarship. Thank you so much to Cynthia Ramirez Bara, who joins us as the College and Career Success Manager for Richmond Promise. The Richmond Promise is a college scholarship and college success initiative committed to closing the degree divide and building a culture of education in Richmond, California, where every young person can thrive. In addition to their scholarship providing up to 1,500 for up to four years in college, their students get support to and through college. We welcome Jorge Espinoza, Scholarship Operations and Student Success Analyst for Stockton Scholars. Their main scholarship, Stockton Scholars, was designed to tackle the higher educational disparity faced by the youth in Stockton, California. This scholarship is specifically targeted at the financial barrier that many students face by giving them $1,000 scholarships um, when they attend a four-year institution and $500 to those attending community colleges. The amazing things about this scholarship is that it is guaranteed given that you meet the qualifications for a total of all four years. And last but not least, a huge thanks to uh, Barb Hendricks who joins us as the co-founder and senior advisor of Students Rising Above. The Students Rising Above Rising Stars program recognizes students with potential and understands the obstacles they must overcome Investing in first-generation students in the nine-county San Francisco uh, Bay Area, Students Rising Above provides a unique level of support that's comprehensive, student-centric, and highly personal. They embrace students with character and drive and back them with professional expertise and passion. Together, they create a community of rising stars that are changing the future through college and careers. And I'm very ex um, happy to have been a uh, a career um, mentor for students rising above um, for the last year now. 
All right, now let's meet our panelists by asking them some very targeted questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show the question and then I'm gonna um, turn off the question so that I can highlight each panelist so we can get to know them better. So our first question is, why does your scholarship exist and who is it intended to serve? Give me a moment while I stop sharing. And I would like to ask our first panelist, Rocio Preciado of Immigrants Rising to go first. Hi everyone, thank you all for joining us. I hope that you get to take a lot of information with you. My name is Rocio Preciado and I'm the High School Engagement Manager at Immigrants Rising. And I myself was formerly undocumented. And one of the biggest challenges for me was being able to identify how I was going to be able to pay for college as an undocumented student in 2009. And Immigrants Rising was one of the very first organizations that was funded in 2006 and developed their very first scholarship. And that was the very first scholarship that was ever available for undocumented students. Ever since then, Immigrants Rising began advocating for other scholarship agencies to open up their scholarships for other undocumented students. And so even though we do not currently offer a scholarship that provides direct money to students, we do have a list of scholarship list. And what the scholarship list has is it has a list of all of the different college access organizations that have opened up their scholarships to be able to allow undocumented students to be able to pay for college. And so our list will be included in the bundle of resources that you're going to be able to access along with the recording. And so one of our missions is to make sure that undocumented young people are able to pay for their college education, that they're able to find the resources to be able to afford college. And we also want to make sure that students spend most of the time applying for scholarships and not searching for scholarships. So our list of scholarships is going to be uh, an opportunity for you able to find scholarships organized by month. Uh, and also will give you the chance to identify what are the scholarships that you're able to qualify for. And uh, Part of the process too uh, is we do have some resources that will give you the skills and the tools to be able to identify uh, what is your personal story so that you can uh, submit a successful scholarship by bringing out the best uh, of you and also being able to share some of your skills. So later today I'll be sharing a little bit more about our resources um, and uh, continue to share a little bit more about the, the list and what we have to offer. Thank you so much, Rocio. I'd like to ask to go next, uh, Noemi of 10,000 Degrees. Hi everyone, thank you again for joining. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Noemi and um, I actually was a recipient of the 10,000 Degrees Scholarship when I was in high school. I was a low income first generation student and two years ago I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, the first in my family to graduate uh, from college. So our, the 10,000 degree scholarship exists to provide equitable opportunities for a population that isn't traditionally supported. So we serve students that are going to college from low income first generation backgrounds, as well as students who are undocumented. Um, there is no GPA requirement for our scholarship and it is renewable for up to six years. So until you receive your bachelor's degree, you are able to get that scholarship every single year. Um, we provide scholarships to students in several regions, so that includes Marin County, Sonoma County, Richmond, Napa, San Francisco, and it is our first year being able to provide scholarships for students in San Jose. Thank you so much, Noemi. I'd like to ask to go next, Leanne from Peninsula College Fund. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Leanne Aratea, pronoun she, they. Um, and Peninsula College, oh, sorry, before that, I myself am a first generation college student. Um, although I'm personally new to San Jose, I wish that um, all the awesome resources that are going to be shared were available um, to me back home in San Diego. Um, for a Peninsula College Fund, they exist in order to serve first generation low income students through scholarship, mentorship, and professional development. Peninsula College Fund is intended to serve exiting high school seniors from a select list of high schools in the Peninsula Bay Area as they begin to go through their undergraduate journey into four-year schools. 
uh, Peninsula College Fund was founded in 2005 with only three students. And recently in 2017, Peninsula College Fund was able to expand to some high schools in San Jose. Thank you so much, Leanne. I'd like to ask to go next, Barb, with Students Rising Above. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm really pleased to be part of this panel. And I got involved with Students Rising Above as a co-founder, and I am now senior advisor back in 2001. Um, and the reason that I did is that through a variety of circumstances, I met some students who needed some guidance for college education and college admission. Through that, I partnered with Wendy Tokuda and also another co-founder, and we started working with low-income first-generation students, knowing what the hardships were in applying from, from that circumstance. I also, both my parents were immigrants, and when I went to college, I did not have a frame of reference either. So I had some background as to what that meant and not understanding what it meant to apply. Currently, we accept juniors in high school during our application process, and that application is due on March 4th. And then once you're accepted into our program, we have a compre comprehensive array of resources besides just scholarship money. It is renewable, but we also have career mentoring. We have an internship program where we do expect our students to apply for internships for at least one summer, if not all the summers that they're with us in college, so that we not only help you with the academic um, counseling, financial aid focus, and certainly assistance, but also prepare our students so that once they graduate from college, they have the skills to apply for their first career level job. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Barb, and thank you for co-founding a fantastic organization. Um, I would like to ask next, uh, Jorge Buck Stockton Scholars. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jorge Spinoza. I'm the Scholarship Operations and Student Success Analyst for the Stockton Scholars team. A little bit about me, I'm a first generation college student. I received a couple scholarships when I left high school, and those definitely had a huge impact on my educational career. Uh, so our primary scholarship seeks to dramatically increase the number of students in Stockton, California, who both attend and complete higher education. Uh, to give you a little bit of background information, only 17% of Stocktonians over the age of 25 have a bachelor's degree. And that's something our scholarship aims to change. And we're achieving this by investing in our youth with a guaranteed scholarship and a wide variety of wraparound support services like a mentorship program and an ambassador program uh, that we run uh, to create a college going culture in our city. Thank you so much, Jorge. And thank you for also providing context as to the statistics in the region. And I believe that for a lot of our organizations here, it's, it's the realities of what's happening in the communities that we serve. That is why we do what we do. Um, and knowing those numbers are really important. Thank you for that. Um, and I'd like to ask to close out our question of uh, why does your scholarship exist and who is it intended to serve um, with Cynthia. Thanks, Mayor. Cynthia of Richmond Promise. Thank you. Apologies. Thank you. Hello everyone, it is a honor to be here and to represent the Richmond Promise. A little bit about myself before I get into my role is I am the daughter of two immigrant parents who migrated here from Mexico. I am also first generation and graduated this past May from UC Berkeley. Um, it's cool to see Barb on here. She actually, I'm part of the SRA, I'm one of the, star, the rising stars, an alumni now. And I'm also an alumni from the Richmond Promise, where I am now the manager of college and career success for students. And a little bit about the scholarship and why it exists. In 2016, it was created to provide monetary support for students going off to college with an intention of up to $1,500 scholarship, regardless if our students are going to community college or a four-year university. And um, ever since then, we support students with not only going off to college, so the onboarding process, but also providing mentorship support um, in their career interests slash educational pathways, as well as near peer ambassadors, campus liaisons for their campuses, and also developing partnerships with local community colleges, as well as four-year universities to better support students not only going through college, but also ensuring that they're successful and have a meaningful career post-grad. Um, and one quick thing is we don't have a GPA requirement, 
We welcome undocumented students. We welcome students regardless of their career plans. And yeah, I'm excited to answer further questions along. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And thank you again to all of our panelists for being here. As you can all hear, we have a wide array of programs and services that are offered by these organizations. Please make sure to explore them um, after this session. All right, so our next question, I'm gonna go ahead and put it up this, on the screen for everyone. The next question for our panelists is where do scholarships come from? And I'm gonna ask for our panelists from 10,000 degrees then Immigrants Rising, then Stockton Scholars, and lastly, Students Rising Above to answer. Um, so scholarships can come from several different sources. Um, they can come from local sources, such as some of the panelists and scholarships um, today. And they can also come from national broader funding sources, um, and as well as they can come from individual donors. So the 10,000 degree scholarship actually comes from individual donors um who want to support students thank you so much noemi rosia yes and to add to what uh noemi shared uh yes there's other programs that i personally was a part of uh, such as college track so there are some college access organizations that begin to accumulate some funding just for being part of the program. So it's also important to look and see what are some of those college access uh, programs that also offer you a scholarship for your participation and engagement in such programs. Um, I also want to second the private sponsorship. So back in 2008, 2009, I disclosed my immigration status to my economics teacher. And my economics teacher saw my student budget and he saw how much it was going to cost for me to go to UC Santa Cruz. And after he saw it, he was pretty amazed as to how much it was going to cost for me as an undocumented student to be able to go to college. And this one, there was when there was no no money from the state available for undocumented students. And so now there is. Uh, but at the time, he went ahead and called me over and said, um, there is someone who is willing to support a student in your situation. He said, adjust your budget, come back to me, and, um, and then we'll see what's next. I adjusted, I actually created a budget and I went back to him and I told him this is how much it'll be for me to attend UC Santa Cruz. Um, I thought they were going to say, you know, maybe we'll give you $5,000 and this educator actually got a hold of a donor who was willing to pay for my four years at UC Santa Cruz during that time. And so there are other ways in which sometimes being able to share your story, you might be able to find uh, people who connect you to additional resources. So there's also the private sponsorship that is available um, for some folks. Um, as well as nonprofit organizations. So there are so many nonprofit organizations that are willing and committed to providing scholarships. And they can, this can be at the very local level, um, scholarships for your city. And this can also be some national organizations that offer greater amounts of money. Rocio, I super appreciate you sharing that example too of like the crowdsourcing um, opportunity. Like when you put your, your desires out there and you let folks know that you need support, um, Sometimes the support can come from any direction you wouldn't expect. So thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, I'd like to ask to go next, Jorge. Thank you. Um, our scholarships are primarily funded by a public-private partnerships, most significantly through an extremely generous $20 million donation by the folks at Snapchat. And yeah, that's the application on your phone, um, which we're extremely grateful for. And several other significant donors include the Denim, Weinberg, and Foster Family Foundation. Uh, we also thank a variety of local community organizations and individual donors uh, that go to our Stockton Scholars our website and make donations because they believe in students and want to see them succeed, not just in higher education, but also in life. Thank you so much, Jorge. And to close out our question on where do scholarships come from, I'd like to ask Barb to go next. And you're on mute. So 
so at Students Rising Above, we do definitely have a private individual donor base that gives us the bulk of the money that we raise for our scholarship and the money that we give to our students and support the resources that we provide our students. And it's interesting to note that our students often ask, who are these people? And where, why are they donating to us? Why are they giving their money to students rising above? What's surprising for the students to know is that our five top donors actually came from disadvantaged circumstances themselves, and they have had the great fortune of being able to have the means to be able to give back, and they give back to the students in a big way. So I would like to thank the top donors for that, but we also have associations with family foundations, corporations, and um, other sort of nonprofit partnerships that we um, get our money from for our students. I would encourage though, not just to look at one organization. If I were a student right now applying for scholarships, there are some interesting scholarships out there. There are scholarships for people with specific names, for instance. If your name is Mary, you can apply for a scholarship. And what's interesting to note is that during the year, we often get emails from scholarship foundations that say, we aren't getting enough applications. Please tell your students to apply. So even though you think you may not qualify for an, a particular scholarship and or you think that too many people apply, apply anyway, because often the case, we get at least 20, 30 emails throughout the year that say that we need more applications so that we can give away the money that we have. So scholarship foundations actually also have more money to give away than they have applicants for. And even in today's environment, that is still the case. So I would highly encourage you to not be discouraged by the scholarships that you're applying for and to apply to the ones certainly that are also look more obscure because nobody applies to those. Thank you so much for that, Barb, and thank you for reminding folks to apply. I mean, we never know who's applying to what, um, so our, and we can't win if we, we can't get anything if we don't apply. So, and thank you for the um, just the the recommendation of also the different types of scholarships out there. I think folks sometimes think they need to look for an art contest or an essay contest, but it could be as simple as your name. It could be uh, maybe the cultural heritage you align yourself with. It could be a specific interest. Sometimes it's your parents' company to have scholarships just for um, the students, uh, the children of their employees. So thank you everyone for sharing the various um, sources of where scholarships come from. Um, and I want to also for any adults um, and um, organizers and practitioners who are listening in, I think you also heard that sometimes scholarships can come from everyday individuals. So we want to encourage you if you're not a donor of a uh, scholarship organization, please please do so. Um, individual donors are just as empo um, uh, empowering and powerful as foundations and corporate sponsors. So I want to go next to sharing our uh, third question. And our third question for our panelists are, um, is, what is the biggest hurdle for students to apply to scholarships? I'm going to ask 10,000 Degrees, Peninsula College Fund, and Richmond Promise to answer. So if um, Noemi, you'd like to start us off? Yeah, to echo off what Barb had said, you know, sometimes the biggest hurdle can be ourselves, right? So don't limit yourself in terms of what scholarships you're applying for. You never know how many people are applying. And like Barb had mentioned, there are scholarships where they need more people to apply. So um, keep applying to those scholarships, even if you feel like you don't qualify. Remember to be your own advocate, asking for support and asking questions along the way before you submit those scholarships and also remembering that scholarships are offered throughout the year. So don't stop applying in the fall. Keep applying and keep looking for those scholarships throughout the entire school year and even when you go to college. Yes, thank you so much, Noemi. Leanne? Uh, yes, yeah, so for myself, um, thinking about like what the biggest hurdles are for students to apply to scholarships, one of the first ones that came to mind would be um, completing financial aid. Um, and in addition, sometimes the capacity of like counselors and school staff to assist students with finishing financial aid. Um, so for example, in the Bay Area, there are um, cash for colleges, which are workshops that are available for high school students um, in the community to get assistance from financial aid experts. So that's just a quick example. But one of the biggest hurdles that I've personally seen 
And this is something for myself as well, like completing financial aid, um, just because they ask a lot of specific questions. And sometimes scholarships require you to complete the financial aid in order to apply for the scholarship themselves. That is such an important point. Um, and thank you so much for making it. Um, and for everyone who's joining us at College Day, you may have noted that there are Cash for College workshops that are part of the schedule. Um, and the San Jose CalSUP Consortium has Cash for Colleges uh, scheduled all the way through December across Santa Clara County. And if you're in Alameda County, it could be through the East Bay Consortium. Either way, please make sure to check in your region where those workshops are being held, but they're often in partnership with either your high school or your school district. Um, and I'd love to go next, uh, Cynthia. Thanks, Mayor. Just to echo off of what everyone else has said, I really wanted to highlight how it begins with you. I know from experience and just from my peers and different students that I have supported, there's always that fear and question of being rejected, fear of not knowing if they're actually truly eligible for a scholarship. And lastly, the fear of being uncertain of the opportunity. I know many students question their grades, question their identities and different stuff aspects of that. And one of the things I did wanna highlight is you don't need to be a superstar to get a scholarship. Uh, scholarships vary, they vary on your identity, your gender, the area you live in, as well as just what school you're going to. I know personally, there's even some scholarships that you don't apply to, but if you apply to a specific college, you qualify for it. Um, and I know that's the case for many UCs in particular. And I would like to also highlight what was already mentioned, which is there's thousands and billions of dollars that go unclaimed. Um, as well in, in this past year in 2016, there was about 100,000 high school seniors in California who didn't file for FAFSA, uh, and that's free money. So I really wanted to emphasize, yes, scholarships, ensuring you apply to FAFSA, but making sure that you develop a plan and you identify the folks that can help you in this process because there's certainly a lot of support available. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I appreciate you reiterating there is so much money left on the table, y'all. Um, sometimes there's scholarships where there's no applicants. Um, so it's not just about you versus someone else. It's just about getting it out there. Um, so please apply. And sometimes just completing one application already sets the stage for the next application. Um, for anyone who's applying to um, colleges using the Common App, um, that has an integration with ScholarSnap, and that lets you use the information in your Common App application and apply to scholarships. So you can take the same information and apply to as many scholarships as possible, um, and that's definitely what we encourage you to do, especially if you qualify. Um, and just to reiterate what was said, the most important thing when you are looking into financial aid, in addition to scholarships, is submitting your financial aid applications. So you heard the FAFSA, which opens on October 1st, and you heard um, the California DREAM Act. Um, if you're foster youth, there's a Chafee grant. We want to make sure that you get all of the aid that you need. So please make sure to talk to your advisors at your college access programs, as well as your high school counselors. Um, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and share the next um, screen, the next question for our panelists, which is, apologies. Do you give your scholarship to the student or to the college? And why is that? Um, and I'm not sure if folks who are watching this webinar know that there's um, uh, the difference. So we wanna make sure that we get to learn more about how scholarships are distributed. Um, so let's have 10,000 degrees followed by Stockton Scholars, followed by students rising above. So Noemi, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, so we give our scholarship to the student because there are a lot of costs associated with going to college that are not just your tuition, right? So thinking about books, thinking about transportation, um, you know, sometimes you're, you're living on your own. So housing, there's several different costs that you, you may have. And so we want to make sure that we give our scholarship to the students directly. So then you can figure out what costs you want to allocate your scholarship money to. And also just remembering that it's important to fill out your financial aid applications. So the FAFSA and the California Dream Act, which are open now until March 2nd, so that you can compare how much money each university you're applying to will give you, um, and then kind of go from there to kind of um, to allocate where your expenses and budget out your money. Fantastic, thank you, Noemi. And how about you, Jorge? 
Yeah. So with the exception of Delta College and University of Pacific here in Stockton, who we have an MOU or scholarship agreements with, our scholarships are directly given to our students via check or direct deposit. And uh, we inform them of what the scholarship is for. And we trust that they know best what their needs are for their education, whether that's paying for tuition, textbooks, school supplies, or even just a meal to get them by. Thank you so much, Jorge. And that is important to understand is that when you have the money go to you, you can use it to apply it to your expenses as you see fits. Thank you for that. Um, and Barb, how about you go next? Yes, so at Students Rising Above, we have more of a hybrid approach. It really depends on what the budget is that we outline with our student before the year begins. So those students who have a full ride, for instance, they may, they may need a monthly stipend so that they can have the Friday night piece of pizza or a cup of coffee or help and join social activities with others um, that they're living with. Those that have less financial aid and need more towards tuition or housing, we will pay directly, pay the school directly. So it just really depends. It is uh, taken on a case by case basis and we evaluate the budget as a whole using the financial aid, the FAFSA, and the outside scholarships that they have, and then we'll create a budget around that so that the student has adequate funds no matter what it is that they might need. Thank you so much for sharing that, Barb, and I think it's important, this note um, point that you've made about um, working with your college access organizations is really like partners to help you figure out and map out where the monies should go and just what your full financial picture looks like. So. Um, I would just like to encourage that for folks who are, um, for students applying to scholarships, um, make sure that you are um, providing as much information about your situation as possible, because it's only when um, your providers, like Students Rising Above, or like Richmond Promise, or like Stockton Scholars, know what your full financial picture is, can they really help you to navigate it and to brainstorm and thought partner to fill any gaps. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists. We are we have already answered four of our six questions, and I've already learned so much as well. Um, I'm going to share our next question, and the question for our panelists is: What can families do to support their students in applying to scholarships? And I'd like to um, expand on the definition of family to be really any of the adults um, or uh, it could even be peers um, who are in our ecosystems that can support us through this process of applying to scholarships and financial aid. So I'd like to ask um, Immigrants Rising to go first with Rocio. Yes, this is a really great question because I think part of applying to scholarships, it takes a full community and it, it really is a network of support and the families definitely do play a key role. And I'm gonna speak in terms of what are some of the things that the parents can do to support their child. And um, one of the things that comes up for me in terms of the things that I was able to see within my own family uh, was my family really supported my engagement in extracurricular activities. So one of the things that my parents said to me, and I know that this can vary depending on the, the family situation, but one of the things that my, my parents said to me was, we don't expect for you to work, but we do expect for you to excel in your academics. And so that gave me permission to get involved in different nonprofit organizations, volunteering opportunities to be able to build strong relationships so that I could then have a letter of recommendation when I was applying to other programs, to universities, and even to scholarships. And um, the other thing is uh, sometimes your child might request certain information from you in terms of your finances or information around what was in your taxes. And so this really is just a message for families, especially uh, if uh, the parents are undocumented. It is important to know and to just reiterate that this information is protected by the scholarship provider. So this information is protected um, and so it will not hurt the family or the parents uh, when they're disclosing this information. And oftentimes um, the child might feel, um, might not feel comfortable requesting this information of the parents. So if you do know that your child is applying to scholarships, building that uh, level of comfort and for yourself also knowing that that information will be safe and being able to have an open communication 
um, with uh, your child. And the last thing is one of the things that I've noticed, and even for myself, when I was a high school student, I had no idea what my skills or what my strengths were. And I never really got that loop of feedback as to, well, what are my strengths? Um, and part of that um, is really important when I was applying to scholarships, you know, just really highlighting what were my strengths. And so even if uh, you are a parent, if you're a guardian, if you're an older sibling, being able to just highlight the strengths and the skills uh, of your child, of your sibling, um, of your relative and this young um, folks so that they feel encouraged and empowered to be able to speak about their strengths because um, oftentimes as young adults we tend to under uh, sell ourselves and so just really uplifting and pumping people up uh, your child or your um, your relative or who is applying to scholarships is really highlighting the strengths that you see and the skills that you see in them Thank you so much for that, Osio. Yes, the affirmations are important. Um, and also the support and actually having the transparent, honest conversations around um, financial aid is really important. Um, and thank you for uh, sharing that. Uh, I'd like to ask to go next, Leanne. Yes, so um, something that I noted was um, something that families or peers can help with is keeping track of scholarship timelines um, so whether that be if certain scholarships have different things um, that are due at different dates. So for example, there could be an essay due in a certain date or uh, letters of recommendation due in a certain date. Um, and something else that peers can also do if they themselves have had scholarship um, application experience or even as like an older sibling or just someone that has a friend that's applying. Um, you could also offer to do peer edits of someone's scholarship essays. So even though it's not necessarily something directly like, oh, here's a scholarship you could apply for, you're still offering some assistance and some support for whoever is applying so that it's not just this person submitting one thing on their own and they're not sure how it sounds to other folks. Yes, thank you so much for that, Leanne. Yeah, you almost need an advisory or a small committee of folks to just help you um, make sure it's the strongest, strongest application possible and you're putting your best self out there, totally, thank you. Um, and to close off our question on what can families do to support their students in applying to scholarships, I'd like to ask Cynthia to go next. Yeah, so just to echo off of what everybody has mentioned, I really wanted to emphasize the role of families and demonstrating, giving out affirmations, that's really important. I know for my UC application, for instance, I didn't know babysitting my younger siblings was something that I actually did and I gained a skill in doing. So little things like that, it's worth reaffirming your, your child, your student, your scholar about because it's a skill. It's a skill that you gained at an early age. It shows a level of maturity that perhaps students don't know of. And secondly, just I really wanted to highlight the point of making a plan. Um, I know parents are always like, okay, like, do I need to save money? It'd be great if you can. Um, but coming from a perspective of a first generation college student, immigrant parents, low income background. I know that certainly wasn't the case for myself and it wasn't the case for many of my peers that I grew up with. Um, and with that, I really wanted to also put and highlight that it's, it's okay. Families can't financially save for students. Um, we understand that that's a barrier and we, I highly encourage just families to, it goes beyond just providing a monetary support to students. It's the moral support, it's the social support, it's the academic support, it's following up with them on a daily basis. Like, hey, did you submit your FAFSA? It's due this day. Um, did you submit the DREAM Act? Did you submit your college applications? Did you outreach to your counselors? Did you meet with your teacher for a letter of recommendation? Little things like that go a long way. I know I enjoy when students parents are involved because then it gives it lets me know that they care and that they're following through um, which is a little funny but it's really nice to see that parents are engaged so i just want to highlight that parents guardians family members uh community members like check in on your students and make sure that they know where they're at and if they don't let's work on a plan let's outreach to organizations nearby as well as just the college or high school they're going to mayor can i jump in I would love for that comment. Ahead, okay, thanks. I just want to expand on what Cynthia just said, and it's it's not direct to this question, 
but it's a, a bit of a tangent. I think that it's really important when Cynthia mentioned that one of the leadership qualities that you can put on a scholarship application when asked for leadership, it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're the president of high school or that you're uh, in sports or any other sort of nonprofit activities. It can simply be that you're working two part-time jobs and helping support the family and that you're getting your siblings up and off to school and that you work with them and their with their homework before you do your own homework so that you can still maintain not only the family income, helping your siblings, but also working on your own GPA. Those are leadership skills. And they actually are very important to include not only on scholarship applications, but on your college applications. So just wanted to kind of take that one step further. And that was a super um, important um, expansion of that note. So thank you for talking about that, Barb. Um, yes, leadership is in shows up in so many different ways and this goes back to a lot of the points that were shared like having people help you review because they can help you make sure you're calling out those leadership qualities um, asking other folks to help you find scholarships because they may be looking for keywords you're not looking for because you're not necessarily thinking of yourself in those terms um, so thank you everybody for those tips on how our family, our network, our community can really be part of the process of us getting ready and setting ourselves up for success for college. It is not a lone wolf thing. It is definitely a village thing. Um, so I'd like to just go with our next, our last question before we take it to the student Q&A, which is for our esteemed panel. Um, you talk to students all day, every day, and you probably train advisors as well. Um, where are you sending students to when they ask for more information about finding scholarships above and beyond what you offer? Are there websites? Are there organizations? Are there blogs? Um, and I'm going to ask 10,000 Degrees Immigrants Rising and Peninsula College Fund to answer, but this is really open to the rest of our panel as well, if there's any resources that you don't hear um, brought up. So I'd like to ask uh, Noemi to um, get us started. Yeah, so the first tip I would definitely give is to start local, right? So asking your high school counselor, your teachers, and also asking any organizations that you may have worked with before or that you're familiar with, just asking all around if there's any scholarships that are available to students in your area. And then there's also some great online tools that you can use to search for scholarships. So that would include College Board and Immigrants Rising. Shout out to Rocio. Um, those are great places to look online for scholarships. And lastly, you know, just remembering again that scholarships are available year round. They're available at the high school level, the college level, and sometimes just advocating um, when you have maybe something that comes up going to your high school, going to someone that you know, or even going to your college. So for example, I had a situation where in the summer where you don't typically receive financial aid, um, I was living off campus and I was living in Santa Cruz where I was going to school. And I was working, but I didn't have enough money to pay my rent. And this time around, my, my mom couldn't help me. And so I kind of started panicking. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to get, you know, it was, I think it was like $700 for rent. Uh, and I decided to go and ask student support services on my campus. Um, and I let them know of my situation. And they actually had a scholarship of the dorms where I was living it was called Stevenson. And that person had actually left a foundation for students that had lived in that housing for scholarships. So I was actually able to get that rent money and I didn't have to pay it back. I didn't owe anything. And so also just being familiar with your campus and knowing that there's going to be a lot of places on your campus where you can ask um, for financial support or even, you know, they had meals provided if you needed meals um, and they have a lot of other resources. So just making sure to be your own advocate, um, and, you know, while you're in college is super helpful. Thank you so much for that, Noemi. Uh, super helpful to hear an actual story of like, here's the challenge and I went someplace and they helped me find something I wouldn't have known about otherwise. Really important to advocate for yourself. And when you don't know the questions to ask, talk to a counselor or adult or something and they can help you frame the question, but don't not ask for help. Thank you for that, Noemi. I'd like to ask Rocio to go next. Yeah, so one of the biggest tips that I have for students is to not self-disqualify. Oftentimes, there's the idea that 
because of my specific circumstances or because of how I'm doing academically or because of the uh, idea of like there being a lot of competition with scholarships, um, oftentimes um, we self-disqualify from these opportunities and we don't even apply. So that is the first thing that I just like to say, do not self-disqualify, apply, apply, apply. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to share is that applying to scholarships in itself, it's not like this gift that students have and that's why they get the scholarship. It really is a skill that you can develop and you the only way to develop it is you if you again apply 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 those scholarships it really is a skill and uh one huge tip tip is um there you students normally get one scholarship for every 10 scholarships that they apply for so if you apply for a scholarship and you get a no that does not mean that you are not qualified uh, to receive a scholarship or that you're not good enough to receive a scholarship. Yes, you are good enough. It will take multiple of tries of applying until you actually develop a system, uh, until you actually get to discover really and just being able to highlight a lot of your strengths uh, to be able to get better. So it really is a skill that someone can develop as they practice it. Um, and I'll just like to share one quick example. So we had this one program participant who was undocumented and this was back in 2008 when he was going to go to college. And so he did not, during the time there was no financial aid and his avid teacher told him, do you really want to go to college? And he said, yes, I want to go to college. And so his avid teacher um, wasn't sure how to support him. But then he came back to him and he asked him, do you really want to go to college? And he said, yes. And he said, okay, so from now on, you are not going to be coming to my class. What you're going to do is you're going to apply for scholarships. So for the first quarter, if you apply for 10 scholarships, you get an A. If you apply to nine scholarships, you get a B. If you apply to eight scholarships, you get a C for the quarter. And anything under that, you are not passing my class. So for him, it was like, oh my God, I need to apply to scholarships or else I'm gonna get, I'm not gonna pass this class. So he started applying. He, the first times he was getting rejection letters, but he was committed to getting an A, so he kept on applying. By the end of the year, he had applied to over 40 scholarships because he already had a system. He already had everything together and uh, he was able to pay his four years uh, at a UC. And then he also had some extra money. Um, once financial aid came out uh, for undocumented students, he actually during his last year, he had extra money and he then was able to buy a car so he graduated without any debt and with a car because he was able to develop that skill and that system of applying to scholarships and that also how he was able to uh, fund his uh, master's degree as well because he already had that system so again it's a skill and one of the resources that i would like to share is that if you go to immigrantsrising.org and if you search if you go to resources and search scholarships you'll be able to find this brainstorm, um, brainstorming um, worksheet to help you begin thinking about your scholarship essay. Um, and there's also a budget that you can also um, use to get a sense of what your needs are. And it also motivates you to continue to encourage yourself and set yourself a goal. Thank you so much for that, Rocio. Um, and that, um, story of the student you know really making a a goal that wasn't like a fixed goal but like he got all the way to probably beyond where he was intending because he it wasn't just i'm going to get 500 dollars i'm going to apply to student scholarships but he really tried to get as much as he could out of that experience and i think the other thing that echoes is that the adults in our students lives can really make a difference in how much we prioritize 
scholarships. So as the adults and family members and um, community members and students' lives, we also want to echo the encouragement of students applying to scholarships and prioritizing it and that it being an ongoing thing. Absolutely. Make it like a part-time job. You will get paid at the end of it. <laughs> Great, so I want to ask to close us out on this question um, and then to see if any other panelists have tips. I'm going to ask um, Leanne to go next. Thank you everyone for sharing um, all your awesome resources. But um, so on my end, when I was thinking about uh, like resources and tips for students, um, I think Noemi touched on it. Looking locally is probably something that's super important that students don't necessarily start out with. Um, in addition to looking at your actual high school and your specific area, there's also local county scholarships. Um, so for example, like Santa Clara County does have a separate scholarship website um, in specifics to where I'm currently located. Um, also in addition, a couple of um, things that students could also look into are specific websites such as FastWeb or scholarships.com. Um, and one huge tip is that you shouldn't be paying to look for scholarships. Um, I think that was previously mentioned probably once, but that's like one huge giant thing, big red flag that they ask you to put your card information anywhere because scholarships are free to apply to. Um, something else that you can also look into are institution based. So what that means is if you are currently um, a high school senior or you're currently in college um, and you're about to um, look for scholarships, they also do have scholarships available through your college specifically. Um, so that's something you could definitely look into. And in addition, I believe we mentioned this prior, but there are also identity based um, scholarships. So whether that's based on ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, um, varying abilities and things like that, these are typically personalized um, for each student. So when we talk about how there's so many resources available um, and different kinds of scholarships available, that's what we're re really referring to just the depth and the width of the kinds of things that you can apply for as a student looking for scholarships, there's definitely still something that you're eligible for. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists already for just this wealth of information, insight, um, uh, and just stories like use cases to let us know that this is this is possible. You can see yourself doing this. Any one of you can get a scholarship. It's about doing the work and putting in the effort. Um, I'd like to just see if there's any other panelists who would like to contribute to this question on what are the top three resources and our tips before we close out and go to our student Q&A. Uh, I don't see anyone unmuting, so I'm going to go ahead and lead us into the next part, which is student Q&A. Um, and what we want to do is really under, um, see if there's any questions that weren't answered yet um, by our panelists with the other questions, if there's anything we can go more in depth on. Um, so let's see what our first question is. And I would like to thank and welcome. Um, today we are joined by Estefania Hermosillo of Immigrants Rising, who's our chat moderator. Um, and she's gone ahead and organized some of the questions for us. So question number one, do scholarships affect my college financial aid? And I'd like to see if Cynthia of Richmond Promise can answer this one. Yes, I can take that on. Uh, I quickly wanted to start off with the distinction of college financial aid and actual FAFSA and DACA. Um, so those FAFSA and DACA are actual support that students get not from the college. The college financial aid component, it's more of the financial aid package that students receive once any grants, scholarships are applied to their student portals. Um, and truly with college financial aid students, it really does vary. So with scholarships and the to answer the question of whether scholarships affect college financial aid, it truly depends. Uh, some scholarships go directly to the student while others go directly to the college or university. When it does go to the college or university, it may vary. Um, in some cases, I have seen students either have a full ride and then have work study or manage to get work study on there, um, which means that there's no room for other scholarships. And if so, it'll have like a cost, uh, basically a cost of an adjustment of like the actual scholarship support that they're receiving. Um, so it may or may not affect students. It truly depends. And I would say the best advice I would provide to students is if they're unsure whether or not any scholarships will affect their financial aid, they can always reach out to their financial aid office at their specific college or university. 
as well as contacting the actual scholarship organization or like foundation. I know some students have reached out to us specifically like, hey, can I get the scholarship sent directly to me instead of my college? Um, and there's case by case where it can get taken, player, taken care of. Um, but that's my tip is that it really depends um, and student engagement is key to ensuring that it doesn't affect college um, financial aid as well as ensuring that students get as much aid as they apply for slash also were accepted to get. I'd like to jump in if I could and add to Cynthia. Um, I, I also think um, there's a big question mark out there when you receive scholarships and you receive financial aid. And then you receive a letter from the financial aid office of your school of choice that says that they have just reduced your financial aid directly because of outside scholarships. And what you need to do in that case is appeal as a low income first generation student is a write a letter to the financial aid office, explain your situation, explain that you're low income and that by the fact that they're taking away or reducing your financial aid produces the hardship for the very reason that you applied to the outside scholarships in the first place. So explain your story and um, and also emphasize uh, while you're doing that in your letter of appeal that you really, really, really are excited to attend that school. And the reason that you're writing that appeal is how excited you are. So you want to cheerlead yourself on, be your own advocate, but also explain the situation so that they can review um, that reduction. Thank you so much for adding to that, Barb. And we actually are running out of time for our student panel. So I think what we'll do is we'll take any questions that we weren't able to answer today and make sure they're included with the guide that we have. But I did want to make sure that all of our panelists had the chance to say maybe one more thing that they wanted to share with you students, parents, counselors, practitioners, um, before we close out this panel um, on scholarships and free money for college. Um, and I will uh, just see if there's anyone who already has something that they would want to share. I can jump in again. Um, I think that if you, as a student, ask yourself, do I want to go to college? Can I go to college? What are my obstacles to going to college? The answer is you can go to college. There are resources out there for you. And there are, at this point in the Bay Area, no matter where you are in the Bay Area, so many resources and opportunities. You have to be your own advocate. You have to do the research. But you can and you will go to and complete college. You can do this. Fantastic affirmation. Thank you so much, Barb. And anyone else? I to... Go ahead, Rosie. I would just like to share uh, to all of the students that you are worthy of receiving financial support to be able to go to college. You are worthy and you've already put in all of the work to be able to apply and being able to receive uh, a lot of that money. So I just really want to reassure you that yes, you are worthy um, to be able to receive um, all of this aid. And there is plenty of aid available out there. Thank you so much, Rocia. Do you want to go next, Noemi? Yeah, and I would just like to add, you know, I understand with virtual school and there's been a lot happening this year and it feels like you're doing this on your own, but just remember that, you know, you have the support. I understand it may not be in person, but you have the support. So just asking for help, asking, you know, your, your counselors, your teachers, if maybe, you know, if there's other organizations that can help you, uh, for example, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are already at your school that are more than happy to help you. So just remember to ask those questions and you're not alone. You know, you have your family, you have your school, you have your peers, you have a support system around you. So please, please, please just remember to advocate. Thank you, Noemi. Any other final thoughts? Can I go ahead, Mayor, really quickly? Please do. Yeah, I really wanted to add what has already with what has already been said and just emphasize that we're in a time where everything's pretty much virtual. At one day, any time of the day, there's at least one 
actual webinar, workshop, meeting going on that is entirely free for students. I know a lot of organizations and just programs in general are providing support for students, whether that be with learning how to apply to their local community colleges, learning how to apply to the local CSU, UCs, as well as any scholarships that are aligned with them that may be an opportunity for them. And I would highly take advantage of it on the student perspective, but as well for families, community members, and anyone, counselors, advisors, like please, please, please research. There's a lot of free events right now more than ever. Um, and it's a great time to take advantage of those opportunities. Absolutely, the opportunity is still here. Um, and we have lots of opportunity to spend this time wisely. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, any final thoughts? All right, well then I'd like to just say a huge, huge thank you to our panelists today. Thank you to everyone who's joined our recording on Free Money Fridays with your local scholarships. Thank you again to Rocio Preciado of Immigrants Rising, Noemi Garibay of 10,000 Degrees, Leanne Aratea of Peninsula College Fund, Cynthia Ramirez Bada of Richmond Promise, Jorge Espinoza of Stockton Scholars, Barb Hendricks of Students Rising Above, and our guest chat moderator, Estefania Hermosillo, The Immigrants Rising. Um, and thank you again from the Northern California College Promise uh, Coalition. Have a great day, everyone.